Evening, everybody. Morning, everybody. Afternoon, uh, whatever other time it is where you are. Thank you so much for joining us for Open Clock Club, our ninth edition. So next week, we've got a special 10-week-old birthday celebration. Not quite sure what we're going to do yet, but we'll try and think of something. Uh, just admitting a few people from the waiting room. So great. We've had um, a busy old week and um, we've put, put out a few new YouTube videos, which hopefully you've seen, and we'd really uh, welcome your feedback on those, please. Uh, what else has been happening? Um, uh, we saw some books, which is cool as well. And the big news is that John uh, has been uh, putting his foot on the gas, and we've got a, a first draft of the Depthing and Bushing uh, e-publication to the printer who will be getting back to us next week with a cost to get that type set and so that's um, making progress so all good um, a special welcome to anybody who's completely new of course this uh, scheme is ideally for beginners anyway and a bit of housekeeping as always before we begin and that is uh, the, uh, the film, the recording of this session will be put on our archive YouTube channel uh, later this evening. So if you want to remain anonymous, then please keep your camera turned off. And the most important thing, just check we've got nobody else waiting to be admitted. The most important thing is the live chat. Now last week, um, because of our <laughs> slightly dysfunctional um, bushing somebody's struggling to get in, a slightly dysfunctional bushing demonstration, uh, we let the live chat run on. And I think that was actually quite a good idea because it gives you people a chance to talk amongst yourselves. So we're going to do that for uh, this evening as well for about five minutes. And I'll be there online as well to kind of answer any questions. Now we've got some questions that were uh, carried over from last week and also our Facebook uh, page has been super busy and we've been doing what we can to keep up. As always, we're gonna split this into three uh, sessions with a couple of minutes between for a comfort break. So the first thing we're gonna do, we're not gonna deal with all those questions yet. So live chat, please keep it coming. <laughs> I think last week, team how to repair pendulum clocks was just about on the limit of keeping up with it so <laughs> it's really good keep that coming I think there's a little bit of a tradition that we tell each other where we're from particularly new members so we can look on the map later and find out where all these great places are so tonight if you remember from last week when we didn't get around to it we're going to be um, removing the uh, brass pinion from our Smith Enfield clock, which is hidden under here. Now, if you've got the book, a eh, thank you for buying it, keeps the uh, bills paid. Um, we leave this as um, an option for beginners. Um, we leave that as an option for beginners to leave it there or not, because it's actually quite a difficult process to get it off and get it on again. So we thought we'd demonstrate that tonight to support those people who maybe left uh, that on. Before we get round to that, there is a little bit of finishing up from last week. So we're just going to head back to our bushing and depth thing uh, session. And you may remember what happened was in the, uh, the white heat of the live demo, um, different clock. <laughs> no, Matthew's oh, there Matthew's he back. is. Matthew. Okay, yeah, he's the host now again. Oh, but he's on mute. He's Matthew, are you on mute? Am I, am I a what, John? That's all right. Uh, are you quoting those Mark Boland lyrics again? <laughs> um, We've been talking about you, but um, anyway. Good, excellent. Um, right, yeah, I think we've had really dodgy uh, connection all week. I'm just gonna have to do the share screen thing. Um, We've had a really dodgy connection all week, so I'm going to blame it on the floods that uh, Rob um, Rob talked about. So let's have a look. Right, that all seems to be okay. Right, are we all uh, present and correct? 
Yeah, yeah. excellent. Good. Okay, right. Sorry about that. Um, we've got a LAN cable thing as well. Uh, so if it drops out again, we'll try a kind of bit of copper wire. So um, if you remember our bushing demonstration, what happened was uh, live demo, I cut the bush a little bit too short. So when I hammered it into the plate, it was loose and then it came loose and all that stuff. So um, there's one here that I've done. If I just get the right side of the plate, here we are. We can see that. Let's just move over to video. Um, that is a uh, much better fit. Now I've cut it. There's a lot of um, talk on these, um, or let us in the meeting, somebody says. Right, okay. They probably got kicked out. Um, so I've uh, cut this the right length, so I have the same thickness as the plate. There's all sorts of talk on the forum about what you do about finishing the bush, as in, um, do you file it down or something like that? Well, from my perspective, um, from a kind of relatively conservative perspective, you don't want to do any finishing to the surrounding plate. We're trying to preserve as much material as possible. So the answer to that is that you make the bush the right length in the first place. Uh, so you either file mm. it on the outside or you turn it down if you've got uh, a lathe available. Hopefully everybody's there now. Um, and then when you drive it in, it doesn't need any uh, kind of refinishing. So we've got uh, this little thing, which is really useful. It's a jeweler's kind of silversmithing stick. And you can see that it's very slightly convex. Um, and this is really great because it's not convex enough to damage the plate, but it just allows you to drive uh, the bush in. So that's what I'm going to do just to kind of prove to myself that it wasn't a complete disaster. So if we move across to the, oh, see my socks there. Let's move across to the, um, got my work boots on, of course. Vice. And then we're just going to use a bit of paper to protect the plate from damage. And we've got our, remember our trusty uh, brass hammer that we talked about last week. And it's just Admit somebody else. Yeah, apologize anybody, our Wi-Fi dropped out, so we um, we lost you for a bit there. So, um, without whacking my camera. Now I might normally put another bit of paper on here and you might ask, well, how do you see the bush? Well, the, re the answer to that is, but the first time you, as long as you know roughly where it is, the first time you hit it, you can see where it is. Look, there's a little witness mark. So there we are, that's, um, that's our bush now flush with the plate and flush with the plate on the outside. Uh, I can't remember what I said last week about cutting the oil sink, if indeed there is an oil sink, maybe this is something we can cover in uh, future sessions, because clocks like this, if you look at these pivot holes, which have been punched up, as you can see, if we get chance after the pinion removing demo, then uh, we will talk about oil sinks. But these holes didn't have oil sinks, so you tend not to make them again. But if you're going to make an oil sink here, for instance, in a clock that has an oil sink, do it before you do the final broaching uh, to open up to pivot size. Otherwise, all that will happen is you'll get the thing running fine for your pivot size, then you'll do the oil sink. The oil sink cutter will burr the metal and then the clock won't run properly. So do the oil sink first, then the opening up and then the deburring that we talked about uh, last week. Now, just something I was uh, thinking of, um, a little, um, oh, somebody else, I think people are struggling to get to us tonight. Um, again, moving over to the dark side, so pretend you haven't seen this. This doesn't really apply to bushing because as you saw last week, we just make another one and put it in and it's absolutely fine. Um, but let's say for instance, you made a new escape wheel and you've made an arbor and a collet and you've put hours and hours and hours uh, of work into that. And you put the two things together and you're working with your graver and it's just a little bit loose. For instance, we can see here, 
this little brass plug, you do that and you think, oh no, I've got to start again. As I said, here it wouldn't matter, you just make another one. But if you've got a lot of investment in those parts, there's a little couple of dark tricks. So as I say, you've got to um, keep this to yourself, don't share it with anybody. You will remember our five-sided um, cutting brooch, which is normally used for making holes bigger, but you can also use it for making holes smaller by pushing the brooch into the hole. Uh, and that raises, of course, five little sort of ridges on the inside of the hole. And not or, turning it. What? And no, not absolutely, turning it. Absolutely, John. Yeah, without you're not turning it here, you're just pushing it into the hole. Um, and what that should have done is made the hole effectively slightly tighter. So you can see it has, but we want a little bit more. So we could do that thing a little bit more. But what we can also do is make the component bigger, he says, using all these terms very loosely. So if you put the component on um, a reasonably kind of compliant surface and get a coarse file, you can uh, put some knurling on it like this which um, you can see that it's also a good way of making really fine knurling. Um, as I say, there's lots of people who will be kind of turning in the grave at this kind of thing, but you can see now. They, they shouldn't because that can save hours and hours of work. It shouldn't, but believe me, John, we probably will get pilloried for that. But there you go. Uh, two little tricks that one day you might just need and you'll think, ah, I can just get myself out of the pickle with those tricks. Um, so does, yeah, there we go. That, uh, does that affect the way or the ability of that thing to be in the hole? To stay in the hole? Yeah, it probably does, Rob. Um, I mean, ideally you want, I guess, as much um, sort of interface between the two components as possible. I mean, ideally, I guess you'd make them new, but you may have been in that situation. I've certainly been in that situation when you call it a wheel and you just make the collet a bit too small. I mean, we're talking about a tiny bit. And so you can just get yourself out of, a, out of the pickle by making that hole effectively a little bit smaller uh, with the brooch, or as you can see here, making the component a little bit uh, bigger. In the case of um, a wheel, of course, you're gonna rivet that thing anyway. So it's really about concentricity. So last week when I got myself into that bit of a mess, there were two things that I could have done to have improved the situation. As it was, I made a new bush. So it was all okay-ish. But actually for, don't have one here. If you're making really fine um, sort of components, the file trick is actually, pretty good. It's like a knurl, isn't it? Like a diamond knurl um, or valve guide or valve guides. Turn this on automatic turners. Knurling. All right. Okay. For valve guides. So it's something that's known to other people as well. Anyhow, uh, how we're doing for time. We'll just take our little break now and I'll get ready for the pinion removal demo. So let's come back at 19 minutes past. I know we lost a few minutes because of the Wi-Fi dropout, but um, yeah, see you in a couple of minutes. Right, hopefully that's just given us a, a minute to come uh, to compose ourselves. The, um, we're going to get this uh, clock apart now and we're going to show you how to remove that pinion. Some, um, somebody talking about knurling. What's the perfect fit for that component? 
Well, if we're talking about that um, wheel where we're colliting it, there has to be zero movement between the two, but you also don't want it to be tied. If we were doing that bush, the trick I just showed you probably isn't going to work because it won't withstand the turning moment of the broaching thing. But I just threw that in there. Um, uh, sorry, distracted as always. John uh, will cringe at this. But if you use these aluminium low power eyeglasses, as I do, a uh, really useful thing, um, I always find they fall out of your eye at the worst time. So I get my file and knurl the edge of it and it gives it a bit of grip. Anyway, I thought you did that to annoy me. I do. That's why I put, no. <laughs> I do everything. My whole life is to annoy you, John. Oh. Right. OK, let's get this clock apart. So um, don't quite remember what page it is, but in our book on disassembly, we make leaving the pinion uh, optional as a reasonable adjustment for the beginner. Now, I'm glad we did that because what I've seen on online forums is people trying to get these pinions off and really mashing into the thing, which if you look at the... Um, square here. Uh, sometimes this this hand is retained by a taper pin and uh, collet, but sometimes there's also a thread here with a knurled nut. That's the other kind, in fact. Yeah, here we are, look. This is the, uh, the other kind, if you can <coughs> see that. You've got a knurled thread, that, you've got a threaded uh, section there. So if you start beating down on this, it's going to destroy the thread. And I've seen people saying, how can I repair the thread? Well, the answer is don't break it in the first place, which is um, easier said than done, of course. So how do we get this pinion here off? So let's just get our clock apart um, very kind of quickly. Um, normally, uh, I've made a YouTube this week about um, wearing gloves. Uh, normally, I'd be wearing gloves here, but it, they just get in the way when we're trying to work very quickly. Um, so many minute wheel off, cannon wheel off. Um, what's the next thing we need to do before we take the frame apart, people? Live chat, let the power down that view, otherwise there'll be an explosion. So we've got our um, <clears throat> homemade let down tool, which you may remember, I was knocking that together. So I'm gonna, again, if I would advise you to wear um, eye protection when doing this, especially if it's the first time you've ever done it. So we're just gonna let the power off. So we convince ourselves that the power is off the train. You can see it's completely loose there. And now we're gonna use the Francis Reed uh, spanner. Frankie knocked this spanner to together today. It's got a spanner at one end, quarter inch across flats and a screwdriver the other. How cool is that? So um, let's get our pallets out like that and like that. This clock has got that problem uh, with the suspension spring that many of these Enfield clocks have got. I've loosened the back cock now. But you can see that the top block of the suspension spring, sorry, there's somebody trying to get in. The top block of the suspension spring is tight in the back cock. And so if you hang the pendulum on, it's not going to assume a vertical position and the clock isn't going to keep time. So again, what we advise here is to remove some burrs off that component. So let's just uh, get that off. And then we'll get the frame apart. So how's the live chat going, Rachel? Good on the live chat. Yeah, yes. excellent. So we need to be thinking about what we're going to do next week for our birthday celebratory 10 week edition. Would have thought we'd ever get to that old. OK, so you may remember in the book, we advise you not to use an adjustable spanner or even worse, a pair of end cutters to get the nuts off. I'm sure we've all done it. Um, so we've got our little brass spanner, which is really cool doesn't mark the plate. How much does one of those spanners cost, Matthew? How much are you charging from Frankie? He's, he's thinking about it. Lots is the answer. 
Right, so this is the point at which we would double, triple check that all the power is up our, our mainspring, particularly with two or three train clocks. You might have let one train down and forgotten about the others. And then when you take the plates apart, you've got a big sort of explosion device on your hands. So there we are. Um, just let's run through this for beginners, because this is what we're about. So here we've got our, oops, here we've got our mainspring hidden inside a, a barrel with the first wheel of the train. The collective name for the wheels and the pinions is called the gear train. Um, so mainspring inside there. This is called the great wheel. We call this the lower intermediate wheel. This one is the center wheel because it's kind of broadly at the center of the clock. Then we've got this one, which in the clocks people call this the third wheel, irrespective of this wheel here, but where we call it the upper intermediate wheel. And then of course at the top, we've got our uh, escape wheel. So let's just lift out these mobiles, checking that we don't bend the pivots. Although we've made a video this week about uh, how to straighten bent pivots. And then I think in this situation, we can't, might just be able to sneak the barrel out past there. No, we can't, can't get the barrel out. So as you can see, I've already been inside this clock. We need to get this component off. Just admit somebody else. Um, and you can see this uh, spring, which is the friction work in this clock is held on with a little taper pin in this case. So let's just pop that out there. Um, the ant is one for an antique and uh, replacement model, but what is the best option? Hard to fix. Okay, so somebody's asked a question about pallets, the anchor. The answer is, I would really never replace if you can help it. I know people don't have the workshop facilities, and dare I say it, um, in my in our book, we talk about adjusting the escapement. The answer is with the pallets, which are here, for instance. You know, I see again a lot on the forums, these aren't particularly badly worn, but where they get worn, that people want to replace them the whole time. And I, what the first thing I would say is try the clock as it is, get everything else done, the cleaning, the lubrication and so on, and then ask yourself that question. They may look bad to us, but actually does it, um, two questions. Firstly, I would say, is it going to cause uh, is a reasonable chance it's going to cause personal injury. So say, for instance, like a clock weight, where the weight's going to drop and it's going to injure somebody. If it is, then obviously you take that seriously. Is it actively or going to cause another problem with the clock uh, causing injury to property? Um, if it is, then you, we need to take that seriously too. In this case, it's neither. Um, and I would say if the clock's functioning well, then leave it alone. There's a lot of peer pressure, particularly on the internet, I see to kind of replace lots of things, which frankly are often unnecessary. Um, it's a good subject for, uh, we could do that next week, could we talk about escapement? Yeah, every team, how to repair pendulum clocks is not in. Um, so next week we'll make that the subject of what we talk about is what you do if these uh, pallet faces are worn. What was that last question, Frank? Oh yeah, so the, should the suspension spring be, uh, I've lost it now, should the suspension spring be loose in the top, uh, in the back cock slot? The answer is no, it just needs to be loose enough. So the suspension and the pendulum arrangement assembly assumes um, a vertical position when the pendulum's on. If it's actually loose, see, I think, John, you had a case a couple of weeks ago, didn't you? I did. Well, yeah, do you want to just tell, tell the audience about that case? Well, the, the um, top part of the um, uh, suspension spring block, whatever it's called, was loose, was loose in the back cock, and it was wobbling from side to side, and it was just enough um, to cause sufficient loss in, of energy in the system that after a while the clock would stop, but it was really difficult to detect um, because it was hard to actually spot that there was any movement. Thanks, John. So yes, the answer is it doesn't want to be loose. It wants to just be a kind of easy sliding fit. So we remove these components. Always watch out here for things like washers. It's easy 
if the clock had been oiled, often this washer sticks to the face of the pinion and then you can lose it, drop on the floor or you don't notice it. So uh, when you remove a component, always just keep an eye out for little um, washers. So now we can remove the barrel. Uh, that's out. If we get time, somebody asked in the week about difficult to remove, difficult to replace barrel caps, might get round to that. Um, and I'll also use the special Frankie spanner to take the ratchet wheel off here as well. Like that, uh, which I would have done first, obviously, normally. There we go. So there we go. We've got all the components we can off this clock. Quite a cool little point about these, in fact, about all clocks is uh, maybe we don't need to start talking about what is a proper job and what is not a proper job just at the moment. But you can see here that there are components like these movement straps and the, um, and the ratchet click and the click spring that are permanently riveted to the uh, clock frame. So if you want to, eventually they're going to wear to the point that they don't function. You know, we're talking about those questions about is it safe? Is it going to cause personal injury? Well, obviously, if the click wears to the degree that you think it's not going to engage properly it could release the mainspring power and then the key flies around and it might break somebody's fingers which is obviously what we want to avoid so there are always questions there about how far you go and how preemptive you are in terms of repairs and there's a reasonable kind of degree and we'll all find our own um position there um, I mean, many of you people will be in things like uh, in an industry, say, for instance, and when you're carrying out a risk assessment for a process in engineering, obviously you think so far ahead that you call reasonable practice. If this component lasts X hours, like an aeroplane or something, whatever it is, I don't know anything about that. And that's why you put together regular maintenance checks, I guess. And in the clocks world, the heritage world here in, in England, uh, people like the National Trust, for instance, have annual uh, inspections. They don't necessarily do any oiling or any um, in, uh, interventive processes, but we do uh, look at the thing to check for stuff like that. So kind of all interesting questions. So here we are. We're at the number of it Before now. you go on, Matthew. Yeah, go on. What about, what, what about that strange finish on the plate? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Thanks, John, for reminding me. Somebody asked, what about the strange finish on the plate? Thank you. Um, the, I think the answer to that, and again, if anybody's there in sheet metal production or industry, they probably know this answer. Please let us know. Um, I think it's to do with stress relieving the plates. Um, how, I think it's to do with stress relieving. You'll know if you've got this material is rolled brass. Unlike that plate that I showed you before, which is cast, this is rolled, so it's stressed. You've got kind of a sandwich of uh, bits of material that are in tension and bits that are in compression. So if you treat one side of this, say for instance, you uh, filed off one surface, the material will begin to curl up like a bit of paper. And I wonder whether Smith did this to prevent that curling. I don't know is the answer. I kind of read that somewhere um, deep in the past. I think, think it's something to do with stress relief and maybe also with cleaning because some people, when they, what they call cleaning, they actually refinish chemically. That can obviously change the surface nature of the material and maybe two of that causes stress corrosion cracking. So maybe these marks are um, something to do with uh, stopping um, deformation due to stress relief. I, I don't know, but Please come back to us. What was the question, Frank? What was that last question? I've forgotten it. Um, how do you remove and uh, reinstall the click pivot? Well, the answer here, let's, uh, let's just keep an eye on the time because we've got to do our demo yet. The answer here, let's say we are X number of um, winding cycles down the N, N number, sorry n number of winding cycles down the road and the tip of the click is worn to the degree that you think there's a reasonable chance it's unsafe okay so you've got options there one option of course is not to run the clock 
is to disable the winding, you can't run the clock, it becomes a relic or a sort of non-dynamic object. And in the world that I work in, and I know a lot of people work in kind of more commercial repairing environments, that's not an option. But I think you should always kind of bear that in the back of your mind, because it's a useful sort of safe place for thinking from which you can then make some decisions. If you decide with uh, either yourself or with the um, owner or stakeholders or whoever it is, you make a decision, we're gonna return this object to what we call safe working order. We have to do something about this. Well, um, if we look at the inside of the plate, we can see that it was riveted on in the factory. So it's not possible to remove that and replace the click um, in a kind of broadly, nothing's reversible, but let's just say for the sake of this discussion in a broadly reversible way. So what I would do is I would present options here. The first option is do nothing, don't run the clock. The second option is that can we safely remove this click and reuse it? And the answer is probably no. But what you could do, for instance, is you could drill it out here. You could um, support the plate, punch it out, put a new click on or repair the click um, by adding, you know, you could add on material here to the nose of it, the rest of it doesn't wear. And then you could maybe tap the back of this and put a screw there so you can at least reuse some material or you may just decide to um, do away with it and um, put a new rivet there and rivet it on. It lasts another 20, 30,000 N cycles. And the point here is not the, um, for me anyway, sorry to be ranting. I'm sure there are lots of other comments in the live chat. The point here is not really what um, intervention you decide on. The point is that you've gone through the process of thinking it through with various options. Um, you know, you think of A, B and C, you maybe discuss that with the owner, you discuss it with stakeholders and you say for these very good reasons, because um, in book two that's out in the summer, we actually call that book developing practice. We haven't thought about practice much in book one. We just wanna get people off the starting line. And an answer there is that the thinking is about practice. Um, as you develop your practice, what happens, of course, um, I've got another question now. What happens, of course, is that I'll do something, I'll say something, we all do this. And if you're interested in and developing your practice, what you say now will maybe tomorrow, next week, next year, five years time, um, you'll have moved on or what we think of as moving on from that position. So it's the thinking rather than the doing is the, is the answer, I think. And what I hear lots and lots and lots online is that people inherit the right way to do things and I'm afraid it's unpopular, but I would just always push back on that. And particularly the stuff that I say, um, you know, push back, push back, you know, respectfully and politely, uh, but say, really, is that right? Are there other ways? You know, we've got 3D printing, we've got spark erosion, we've got uh, CAD modeling. We've got a whole lot of new things that we can uh, employ uh, to help us along. Could you adjust the spring causing the yeah, you could adjust the spring. In fact, um, you can see here on this clock, Santa crazy, uh, must get around to doing the actual demonstration, sorry. Crazy design here. Why would you have the spring working that far from the pivot? Why didn't they put the spring so it was working on this side of the click and closer to the pivot? It would be much more sort of uh, clicky, sort of lively action. I suppose they've got a longer spring here, but you can see this spring's been um, manipulated by a pair of pliers and killer thing when you first assemble any clock, well, any spring driven or weight driven clock, that the ratchet click mechanism must be nice and positive. If it's not, it's gonna cause you a problem. If we look on this clock, uh, it's obviously, um, or not obviously, but I presume that for some reason the spring has broken or they've tried to get it off and straighten it and it snapped. And so they've used a piece of brass wire. Now, a lot of people would frown at this repair, but I think it's actually really cool little repair. It's, um, you know, sort of minimum intervention. It seems to do the job perfectly uh, well. I really like that 
thing, it looks perfectly safe to me. However, some people will say, no, it's a bad repair, da da da. Anyway, um, we could discuss um, till the cows come home. The point is that as you develop your practice, the one thing you will know is that as time goes on, you will begin to question what you did five, 10, 15, uh, 20 years ago. And for me, that's incredibly healthy. So a good bit of positive pushing back is a good thing. Uh, the other question was, uh, should a beginner take on repairs of a mantle cuckoo clock with some security in the strike train who may be worn out with flares more soon? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, the, where, do, where does a beginner begin on clocks? Um, good question. John and I discussed this at great length. In fact, I've probably um, bored you with the story uh, before that we started talking about French clocks for our first book. And then after about X years of writing, realized that French clocks were too sort of delicate, too complicated. So that's why we looked for this clock. Now, some of you will have um, craft experience. Maybe you're a maker, maybe you've got engineering experience. So there's nothing wrong with taking on more complex things to begin with, but the big thing about this clock, and I'm sure John will agree, is that the whole point of this book is a confidence building exercise with, without sounding <laughs> like too badly done to. When I started, this information didn't seem available to me. And there was a lot of ego about repairing complicated clocks. I would push back on that. Do this, do another single train clock, maybe like the American ones with an open spring and build up to that. But the key thing is, for the beginner, I would say never work on clocks that belong to other people, even or particularly maybe friends and family. Because if you run into difficulties, if you bought the clock like this on eBay and it's cost you $30, the worst that's gonna happen is you've lost $30. But what you don't want is somebody ringing you up and saying, is my clock fixed and da da da. So for the, until you've reached a stage where you feel confident, then work on clocks that you own. Then frankly, it doesn't really matter um, what you do. Okay, so we're gonna take our next one minute break now. Uh, a couple of minutes, let's call it 43. We'll come back and we'll get this um, pinion off and back on again. Okay, see you in a couple of minutes, 43. Matthew, did Smith make uh, uh, striking versions of this sort of thing? On mute? Matthew? They do. Uh, they, they do, Rob, almost exactly the same. In fact, a lot of the parts are interchangeable. Um, and that's book two for us. Thank you. Well- uh, straight into our trap. Well planted, well planted question. Um, I'm sure somewhere I've got a hundred of these movements in bits, but yeah, that's our next stage because as you well know, Rob, the, the big, the only difference really between a striking clock and the, the single train clock is the dreaded problem of getting the phase relationship right between the warning and the lifting of the hammer and all that stuff. That's the big challenge of the second clock. So it's useful if the rest of it is kind of um, the, the, the same thing. So yeah, then they do a three train, which we're gonna get and look at, you know, Westminster striking clock. 
And so we're going to do this. Oh, sorry, got somebody waiting there. We, we do this single train, two train, maybe three train, don't know. French clock, count wheel striking, rack striking, long case clock, 30 hour, eight day, then fusey clock. I think that's our plan, isn't it, John, if we live uh, long enough? Um, yeah, I mean, my, my preference would be to do the French clock before the three train one of these, but... Um... Yeah, because we've already kind of broken it back, haven't we? Hmm. Okay, let's get back to it. Um, Hopefully everybody's there who needs to be there. So our challenge here is how do we get this component of this arbor um, that's pushed on in the factory? So it's a really tight uh, fit. Um, obviously we could hammer on this end, which is actually what we're going to do. But all that's gonna happen is this component here is gonna get damaged where the hand goes so you cause you a problem. And also the plate, which you can see, is pretty um, bendy, is just going to deflect. Uh, so you're gonna be hitting away with your hammer and getting frustrated. So the first thing we do is we support the plate on the inside with this thing, which is called the split stake, which you can buy on the internet for not, well, I say about 10 pounds, maybe $15 or something. Um, you can make them yourself, of course, but a really cool, useful thing uh, in, I had one that got so kind of used up that you end up cutting bits away and drilling new holes and stuff. So we're going to use this on the inside of the plate. I'm actually find the one that the hole fits in, like that, to support the plate when we hit down on this end. Now, we can't hit on here with our hammer because it's going to damage it. So what we need to do is to find some way of protecting that square. So we measure the across flat size of that square. I know in this case, it's just about two millimeters. Um, this thing is called a split stake, brass split stake. Um, so this is two millimeters across flats. Now, when we first started, I started making a little bit of wire with a hole in it and filing it. And then I thought, duh, um, what we actually need is to use one of these winding keys as our um, device for pushing off the, uh, the pinion. So, the, I mean, I, I think I paid two fifty three pounds or something for this key, um, uh, 2.25 millimeters, so it's 0.25 of a millimeter uh, across flats bigger than our thing. Statement, I would use a deep socket. Yeah, you could use a deep socket um, if you protect the work. And in fact, in uh, version two of our thing, we're gonna show you how to do it using this bit of hardwood, uh, the good old trusty drumstick, which is kind of the same thing. Um, the thing is with the socket method, we need to get this, you can use it to drive it on, um, but actually we want to use that to drive the thing off. Anyway, um, so we get our key and we separate the butterfly section from the shank of the key, which I've done. Here's one I prepared earlier, uh, like this. And I filed, if you look inside the key, there's a little lead in there, kind of a cusp, which you don't want, because you don't want it to kind of squidge outside the square. So I filed that off here make it nice and square. So I'm gonna support the inside of the frame with our brass split stake. I'm gonna put on the square and I'm gonna uh, tap the pinion off. I'm also going to just for extra kind of not damaging the plate, I'm gonna take a piece of paper and good gosh, we're doing really well for time today. Despite our internet outage, I'm gonna take a bit of paper, fold it, like this. Um, there's a program in Britain, uh, I don't know if it's still or not, called Blue Peter. I don't know whether you have a similar thing in the States or elsewhere uh, where they do sort of crafty stuff like this. So that is going to um, go underneath there when we push the thing back on again and it's going to protect our plate from damage. Okay, and we're gonna do the same thing uh, on the inside, if I can find another bit of paper. So we'll move back to our vise, like this. Get rid of 
that put our now because of the way this thing all fits together we have to actually hold the brass split stake on an angle uh, so we let's get this manipulated in here like that now we don't want any part of the clock frame to be touching the uh, vice otherwise it's gonna damage it C can i just interrupt for a second matthew yeah um, i'm just responding to a couple of things that have come up all right go on yeah cool devishish says um he's he's seen two for sale um which size would you recommend of those split stakes and my view personally is if you find someone that's selling two different sizes of split stakes stakes and they're cheap by both sizes exactly uh, by both sizes they're really um, and the other thing is bill five uh Pfeiffer says um do you measure the position on the shaft for reference when reassembling good question but actually it's something to bear in mind for when you're reassembling it. Uh, yeah, it's a really good question, Bill. Thank you for that. Frankie, who you remember a few weeks ago, told us about his experience with a striking version of this, um, where the, I'll show you it in a minute, where the, that pinion has got lifting pieces on it. So absolutely, yes, you get a bit of graph paper and just like I've done with that bit of paper, draw on there or make a note of the relationship between the minute hand and the lifting pieces otherwise when you come to put it back together again uh you'll the hand won't be at the o'clock position when it strikes so brilliant um question that so the answer is yes in this case it doesn't matter uh it's there's no kind of relationship between those two um pieces so let's just see if this works so like that and there we go. So that, as you saw, try not to drop it on the floor, actually made incredibly light work of this job. But the, if you hit that with a metal, you know, with a steel hammer and um, just get it off there, you can see when you take the component off, you can see there's a little kind of flange on the inside. So remember which way around that goes, otherwise it won't work when you um, put it back together again. So we can't. We would kind of do the uh, opposite for um, refitting. We would uh, put a little bit of light oil on there first, just to allow it to go on a bit easier. Push it on, support this on the split stake, and then we have. Um, where are we? Wait a minute. I think this is it. We've got a bit of metal. Yeah, with a hole drilled in and the metal is slightly thicker than the pivot. So we can hit on this with our brass hammer. Uh, our split stake goes here like this. And we just reverse that operation. In fact, I'll do that in a couple of seconds. You've got another question. Uh, which one, bottom one? Second what? Cloud bars. Yeah, um, there's a couple of things there. Somebody said, how does Matthew feel about using a set of pry bars? The problem here is that the plate is really thin. So, I mean, you could, yeah, you could put some bits of paper again or thin card behind that. If you feel the plate is thick enough to uh, take that leverage, those little um, pry bars as, uh, are used a lot in watchmaking for moving watch hands, which are fine. Now, you can also get a thing like a puller, and I know pullers are used a lot in industry for removing bearings and drive shafts and things from CV joints. I've never used one personally, but that's not to say it can work for you. I suppose the principle of this is that we're making tools, bits of brass to prevent damage, because believe me, it's a heck of a lot. This might seem like a faff. Um, but it's a lot easier than uh, damaging the component and then thinking, right, now what I do, I've got to remake the thread or something. Uh, would those lifting pieces have to wear in the pole? Which lifting pieces? All oh, right, okay, yeah. Let's just, let's get this back on and then we'll just talk about the two train version. 
Um, yeah. Uh, it's always a push on fit to Dave L. It's never soldered. No. So we're just going to reverse the operation. But as I said, this time we've got a bit of um, metal that's already been used, which is why it's got that mark on it, which is just a clearance fit for our pivot. And it's, of course, slightly wider. The metal is slightly thicker than the pivot is long to prevent um, damage there. So let's not try to whack my camera. Let's just tap it on. Checking here that the shoulder on the arbor isn't damaging the plate before you begin to tap it down. Now it go, in this case, sometimes like a gathering pallet on an 18th century European clock, it might not go down to a shoulder. So it's ever so easy to split that component. But again, take loads of photographs and measurements before you take it apart. In this case, um, it goes down to a shoulder. So we can hear when it's, um, when it's got to the so-called right position. Let's have a little look how we're doing here. Yeah, we're good to go. Let's just go the key, back. The key thing is that you've got end shake and side shake. Thanks, John, absolutely. If um, okay, um, this uh, absolutely you've got this thing which is called um, end float. I think in engineering we call it end shake in clock making, and you've also got side shake. So you've got a little bit of side movement of the arbor as well. This is absolutely critical. Going back to our depthing and bushing thing, this is the problem with doing a load of bushing that inevitably you're going to at one point change that and it causes a whole lot of problems. So thank you, John, absolutely critical. If the arbor, when the clock, if I can find the other components of the clock, when it's reassembled like that, it absolutely must be like this. So just spin the arbor a little bit and can you see, even though the clock is actually at sort of inclined at only 45 degrees, the arbor is falling freely onto its shoulder. If it, if doesn't, it doesn't do that, that, the clock will stop. The clock will stop. John is absolutely spot on. Try it the other way. So let's get our brass tweezers and do this with every arbor. If it isn't completely loose like that, it will come back to bite you. And the problem with tight bushes or something you think, yeah, it's okay, is that you oil it and you take, uh, right, okay. If you take um, the clock back to the customer, if you're working on customer clocks, three months go by, I bet you a pound to a penny or a whatever currency, uh, that it's because that hole has started to bind up. It won't do it straight away. This is the problem. It'll start to go once the oil has maybe evaporated a bit or spread a bit and the two surfaces begin to micro cold weld, the clock will stop and it costs you a day and embarrassment and all that kind of stuff. So if there's one thing I've kind of covered tonight, it's that if you ever do bushing um, or any uh, operation like this, if the arbor doesn't fall totally freely and you can hear it going click, 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 it's too tight. And it, as John quite rightly says, it'll hurt you. Somebody just asked about, we're about out for time. Somebody asked about the vice. I use a record number one vice, a record number zero vice is also good. And I use these fiber based um, jaw things, uh, vice protectors. I don't use metal, brass or aluminium there because they tend to get other metals in them, which then mark the work. These things are a consumable, you know, they last two or three years and then they get mangled up and you uh, chuck them away. What you can also do, which they did at the um, Westin College where I used to work, is that they got the vice jaws ground, precision ground flat. And that actually works quite well. Um, if you've got access to an engineering shop, take the vice jaws off your vice, 
take them down there and they might grind them flat for you. But I can say, Matthew, yeah? those record vices, if you take the vice jaws off and yeah. turn them upside down, they're flat on the other side. Top tip from John. What more could you what more could you want? Thanks, John. So in the last minute, are there any more questions we haven't covered? Um, going back to, was it Bill before? Thanks, Bill, for asking this question. Now, this is a bit of a um, hybrid clock at the moment, but you can see that this pinion has got the two lifting pieces, the long one for the hour release and the short one for the uh, half hour release. And if only if I could find a clock hand, which I... Can. Obviously, it's critically important that the hand is in the right relationship with that lifting piece. If you just put the relation, put the lifting piece back on in any old place, the hand won't strike. Now, what I see hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times is people have put the clock back together, they put the hand, the movement back in the case after they've had it on the test stand. Let's not go there, joke. And um, they go, oh, the hand's in the wrong place. So of course, rather than take it apart again and do it, do it, what they do is they get uh, a bit of square material, like a file handle thing in that square, put that in the vise and wrench this thing round, which damages it and it makes a rivet loose and it often breaks the hand off. So um, Bill will say, thank you for that question. When you're taking things apart, and it's dead easy nowadays with um, you know mobile phone cameras and things, take loads of photographs, make loads of notes, and at least for the beginner, only work on clocks that you uh, own. Right, we're out of time, so uh, thank you, everybody. Good to see you, Rob. Thank you, John, as always. And I slightly forgot what we're going to talk. Oh, we're going to talk about pallets next week. Gosh, that's going to be good fun. Uh, so we're going to talk about what you do when pallet faces get worn. And again, as I said before, I don't have a de definitive answer for that. But what we do have are some things that we can kick about and you can maybe add a few more skills to your toolbox. So I'm going to leave the chat open for a few minutes. I'm going to turn the camera off. Uh, so if we want to chat a bit more, then we'll stay on till five past uh, six. So sure. thanks very much. Follow us on um, uh, Facebook and look at our new YouTube videos and we will see you uh, next week at the same time. Thank you. I hope you get to uh, go on Amazon Canada because uh, I'd like to see your books come here too. I think you're but, muted. Yeah, we're working on that. We. Um, are doing a thing in uh, England at the moment where the books are on eBay and we're doing free UK postage. Now I've had two American uh, orders to America um, and I don't know how much that is. So it might just be worth looking on eBay and seeing through their GPS, is it called? G GSP program, how much it costs to get it shipped out to Canada. Hopefully it's not too crazy. But well, we are setting up um, an Amazon.com account. But as I maybe explained the other week, it's a completely different account. Uh, so we've just got our Amazon Europe one going. We've got to start another one, pay a whole lot more fees, which is fine. But it just takes uh, time. So please be uh, patient. Thank you. Um.